Good morning. We join the chorus of the nightingales. Did you hear that? Uh, as we celebrate Earth Sunday, uh, which is celebrating Earth Day tomorrow, I like to say every Sunday here at Hennepin is Earth Sunday. Uh, but I'm delighted that we got to share with you the nightingale stop uh, for the first time, for a good long time. And um, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I want to draw your attention to some of the things happening because Earth Sunday is happening. You no doubt came in through the east entrance and saw the things from old school. Uh, that is the thrift store that's affiliated with this congregation. And we believe in reusing and recycling. And so buy things on your way out and find your way to old school anytime you want to donate things, recycle them, and get new things. They have a remarkable store there. I also want to draw your attention to the art that is in Carlson Hall. It is from United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities, which is a sacred, holy, and generative place. We have today joining us in worship the Reverend Dr. Molly Marshall, who is the president of United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. Molly is a remarkable leader. You see her, uh, her things in the bulletin, but I just want to say that Molly has led United into a new vibrancy that is just absolutely thrilling to be a part of. United prepares innovative and compassionate leaders for the equipping of churches, other faith communities, and society toward justice and peace. And the core values at United are community, commitment to intersectional justice, and creativity and curiosity. Uh, so I am a graduate of United Theological of the Twin Cities and I serve on their board of trustees and so I have some opinions about UTS and I'm really glad that Molly is here and about her excellent leadership. So you have a treat in store for you. I want to draw your attention to a triple threat we're offering here at, at uh, Hennepin today. You have the Reverend Dr. Molly Marshall preaching, which is great gift. Following worship, you can go down and get brunch and then go up and hear the Reverend Dr. Tim Eberhardt teach up in the art gallery around eco-regeneration. And then at 12.30, the Reverend Dr. Wilson Yates, former president of United Theological Seminary, will be giving a lecture about spirituality in the arts. So you might as well just not plan on going anywhere. And just stay, eat the bacon, enjoy a good conversation and good people. And if you don't want full brunch, there are donuts. But um, <clears throat> we are blessed with so much goodness here, and uh, I hope you know our gratitude for your presence, whether you are here with us online or joining us in the flesh. It is a beautiful day out there, yes? Yes, let us continue in our worship. Please stand in body and spirit for the call to worship. Every part of this earth is sacred. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the children of the earth. The air is precious, for all of us share the same breath. This we know, the earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. This we know, all things are connected, like the blood which unites one family. Our God is the same God, whose compassion is equal for all. For we did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Every part of this earth is sacred.
please join me in prayer. God, our creator, you have made us one with the earth to tend it and to bring forth fruit. May we so respect and cherish all that life from you that we may share in the labor of all creation to give birth to your hidden glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. And the children can come on up front with me. Good morning. Oh my gosh. Guys, every time when I talk to you, what are you supposed to do? Good morning. Kira got it. Okay, one more time. Good morning. I think we're a little sleepy today on this Earth Sunday. It's crazy. All right, well, I'm going to give you a chance to talk. I have a question for you. What do you think is the farthest place you have ever traveled to? Turn and talk to somebody. Adults, this is a great time to meet somebody around you. Maybe just turn your head. What's the farthest place you've ever traveled to? Talk to somebody. I'm going to give you like 15 seconds. Go. Alabama might be the farthest you've been. Yep. Oh, yeah. Florida's actually farther. And Vancouver might be even further than that. Okay, who's got, who's got an answer? What, what did you talk about? What's one of the farthest places you've ever gone to? Ronia. Ronia's gone to Sweden. That's pretty far away. Yep. Anybody else up here? Anybody else gone anywhere? Where have you gone? Jasper, Jasper Wyoming. Oh, Canada, that's far, yep. Sydney, where have you gone? You went to Florida just a couple weeks ago, you went to Florida, yep. Uh, the farthest place I've ever gone, thanks for asking, is uh, I went to South Korea, which was a really long plane ride to get there, like 14 hours, it was very far. And you know, I learned this really cool thing. I learned that the monarch butterfly, anybody know what color the monarch butterfly is? Orange and black. I learned that the monarch butterfly, when it migrates, so when it starts to get cold here, it will fly south. That's called migrating. And then it comes back up north. And do you know how many miles it has to go? Not 20,000. That would be really far. Any other guesses? Jenny, you got a guess? No? It has to travel. Oh, Kira, what do you got? 200. Good guess. Sydney, good. What's your guess? 100, it's more than 100. 3,000 miles. Look at this. Here's a map. If you can't see it, you can move up. So here's a map of the United States. And it has to fly. Sit down so people behind you can see. Thank you. It has to fly. Up here, it starts to get cold. It flies south down to South America. Then it hangs out down there because it's nice and warm down there while we get snow and it's cold. And then it flies back up and it comes back up here. 3,000 miles. How big is a monarch butterfly? It's like this big, like three inches. It can fly that far. Isn't that amazing? But here's the thing. When it comes back up north, it's looking for a special plant. Does anybody know what plant it needs? What's it looking for, Ronya? Say it louder. You're, you're right. Milkweed. It's looking for milkweed. Look, it's looking for this. Because this is the only plant that it can lay its eggs on so that more caterpillars can be born. Because the caterpillars eat the eggs of the milkweed. And then those caterpillars turn into more monarch butterflies. And if they can't find milkweed, they don't have any place to lay their eggs. And we won't have any more monarch butterflies. So this today, after church, you are all invited. And you are all invited as big kids to when you're on your way out the door, we're going to have some planting stations where you can plant your very own milkweed as a way to care for the earth. Because the earth, everything in the earth was created by God. And it is for us to enjoy, but also for us to take care of. And so you can plant your own milkweed today, and then you can plant it at your house, maybe in a flower pot, or if you have a garden, and then you can watch to see, hopefully some monarchs will come to your house, and you can say, good job, you traveled 3,000 miles when you see them in your backyard, because they have gone a long way, okay? I also have a butterfly for you to take, but I'm not giving this to you yet, because we're going to go do something with it in Sunday school, okay? You may line up at the door, and we will head out.
Will you continue with me in prayer? And as we pray responsibly, I invite you to respond each time you hear creating God with the words, hear our prayer. Would you pray with me, please? In a world springing to green, we pray on this day for farmers and all who are in relationship with the land. May we work in harmony with creation in such a way that we evidence reverence and wonder. As the earth wakens from winter, we pray gratitude for the soil and water, air and sunlight. Lead us to be stewards of the sacred gift of your creation. Creating God, hear our prayer. We pray on this day for those affected by the threat and the reality of war. For those living in Palestine and Israel, Ukraine and Iran, we pray for swords and drones to be beaten into plowshares. Grant leaders and soldiers and civilians your peace. Creating God, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are gathering in Charlotte over the next two weeks to do all the good they can in crafting our shared vision for the United Methodist Church. May all who gather feel a sense of common kinship and a desire to legislate and dream the Methodist movement into a fully inclusive future, creating God. Hear our prayer. We pray on this day for our teachers and our schools. Give to those called to teach, sustaining power to touch the lives of children and youth and adults for kindergarten teachers and those who teach middle schoolers, for seminaries as they support soulful and courageous leaders, for Pastor Laura and the confirmation students on retreat over this weekend, for Mamie and for all the teachers who give their hearts to offer Sunday school for our children, we pray gratitude and grace. They are seeding our future with heart and beauty. Help us to live our thanks, creating God. Hear our prayer. For this church, we pray for a continued openness to the winds of your spirit, God. With nearly 150 years of ministry behind us, we lean with anticipation into the future with curiosity and excitement. Help us to live into the promise of all that is yet to come. We trust your presence in our gathering, in our brunching, in our learning, in our living. Keep us people of open hearts and minds and doors, we pray, creating God. Hear our prayer. And we commend to your spirit and your wisdom the prayers that we carry in our heart as we share some time in silence. For all good gifts all good questions and for the wonder of your sustaining spirit we pray as your people the people of Jesus and we pray using the words given us by our kin across the world many miles from us connected as we are in your spirit we pray together God who is in us here on earth holy is your name in the hungry who share their bread and their song. Your kingdom come, 
which is a land flowing with milk and honey. Let us do your will, raising our voice when all are silent. You are giving us our daily bread in the song of the bird and the miracle of the corn. Forgive us for keeping silent in the face of injustice. Don't let us fall into the temptation of taking up the same arms as the enemy, but deliver us from evil. Give us the perseverance to look for love, even if we fail, so we shall have known your kingdom, which being built forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to rise and sing these words from Psalm 23. be seated. <clears throat> if we could recite Psalm 23 every day of our lives, it would not be too much reassurance. God sets a table before us, a table of grace, of flowing waters of forgiveness and assurance 
and presence, and we are the people called to set the table of God's grace in every place we find ourselves. So for us, we're in the middle of the city, and we have table setting to do. As we enter into this time of offering, I hope you give thanks for the abundance in your lives and the power we have when we join our abundance says together in order to offer grace. So let us enter into a time of offering. of all life, we give you thanks that we are not mere spectators in this world. We are people who are called to share the gifts of this world, north and south, east and west. And we trust that the gifts shared on this day will broadcast your grace. Grant us courage and wisdom and blessing and bless these gifts, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I think that may be my favorite anthem ever. 
Yeah, I would invite you to turn if you are of a mind. We aren't going to be reading from the book of Acts. We are going to give you a chance to speak the words of Psalm 23 with your own bodies. On page 137 in your hymnal is the King James Version of Psalm 23. You may know it by heart, and then you don't need to open that hymnal, but should you desire to, we will speak all of the psalm together in unison. I'll give you time to find it. I invite you to listen for the voices of not only the people around you, but the people who have spoken these words through the ages. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this reading this morning from John's Gospel, speaking of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know him. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, and all who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved. And will come in and will go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. Grace and peace to all of you. It is wonderful to be here with you today and greetings from United Theological Seminary. We are so proud to claim Elizabeth as our alumna. It's a pleasure to be in worship with you in this tender time in the Christian year and tender time in the life of the UMC. I very much appreciate your prophetic presence, your undying commitment to inclusion. I know there's a big meeting going on, and I pray for the wind of the Spirit to prevail in that time. I grew up Baptist, so I don't know anything about church fusses at all. <laughs> There are many connections between United and Hennepin. You have 
sent us faculty members, students. You have sent us board members, even two presidents from this congregation, Keita McVeigh and Dr. Wilson Yates. Thank you for that partnership over the years. And now, Elizabeth, whom we commend to you for this good season. There's a really popular course at Yale University. It's entitled Life Worth Living. And so the title of my sermon is basically cribbing that the name of that course taught by some friends of mine there at Yale. Students literally register for the course semesters in advance. It is so popular. It asks the big question, what is worth your life? It's an important question to be asking while in college or before college or all the days of our lives. Now, instructors caution those who sign up for the course, this course may wreck your life. <laughs> we ought to have that warning on many syllabus, shouldn't we? Instructors caution that the text that they will read may interrogate all of their assumptions. In a consumerist society, it even probes the question, what is worth wanting? Now the charism of the course is that it draws from lots of different traditions. It takes Holy Scripture, it takes the Quran, it takes Confucius, Buddhism, Taoism, Plato, the lives of Oscar Wilde, Ida B. Wells, Frederick Douglass, the teachings of Jesus. In humility, it does not assume a single source of wisdom in the world, but there is to be gleaned from all of these good insight. One of the things that the Course stresses is your life is worth more than what you earn. Your life is worth more than where you live. Your life is worth more than all the degrees you accrue. That one's really hard for this academic to hear. The Course asks uncomfortable questions of expressive individualists, how one theologian has described the identity of contemporary people. The most fraught question is to whom do we answer? Eastertide circles back to these familiar texts, and I believe that they point toward a life worth living. In this most beloved and most frequently recited psalm, we hear life lived within the sphere of God's care. I really don't want to relegate that psalm to funerals. As Elizabeth said, we should read it regularly. In a sense, it points to life in its fullness. And it turns the question of to whom do we answer really back on God. It seems that God answers to the human through provision and protection and purpose. I couldn't help but alliterate just once as a Baptist. It seems in this psalm that God answers the human and not simply the human answering to God. God as shepherding presence guides the pilgrim through all the exigencies of life and the shadow of death arriving at an overflowing cup for all the days. 
The reality of danger and distress, lack and threat are acknowledged in the psalm. It's a different genre, actually, in the Psalter. It's not a communal lament. It's not a song of thanksgiving. It's not a royal or wisdom psalm. In fact, it is sui generis. It's a song of confidence. It's a descriptor of trust. God restores the whole self. God is both protecting shepherd and welcoming host. Well, the same shepherding imagery is picked up in John 10. And once again, the metaphors stack up on each other. Jesus is both good shepherd as well as gate, and you can know those hearing that long, long statement would have probably scratched their heads. What actually is he saying? Clearly, the emphasis of the passage is that Jesus is the one to be followed for his tender knowledge of them, calling them by name. His is the voice to be trusted. In a day when calls to say their name, this text takes on new importance. It is significant to use the name that a person prefers, even if it befuddles some of us, as the name does not always stay the same. This past Friday, I went to a sheep farm, which is pretty good preparation for Good Shepherd Sunday. I I was just loving looking at all the sheep on the screens. When I entered the barn where the ewes and the lambs were, uh, my host for the day, a venerable sheep farmer, spoke quietly. They didn't run away. And because I didn't say much, they tolerated my presence also. But there was a familiarity of the sheep with this loving presence who tends them day by day. I ask a silly question, uh, how do the ewes know which one is their lamb? Oh, they figure it out. They talk to each other. I hear mama over here and lamb over here, and they find each other. I thought, what a wonderful metaphor. Calling out, finding, being near. Now, the passage in John has often been used in a destructive way. It's been read in a supersessionist way, as if everything that came before Jesus castigates the Jewish kinfolk whose sacred day begins, sacred season begins tomorrow with Passover. A better reading is simply to accent it's perilous to follow the wrong shepherd. All that went before built toward what Jesus was bringing. More likely, he is warning against messianic pretenders that preyed upon the people. And if you read Josephus, I would recommend it if you're you're having trouble going to sleep. Read Josephus, and he will tell you all of the wannabe messianic pretenders in first century Palestine. It had its share of revolutionaries and people pretending. The summative verse of this section in John offered these words, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And the best translation is, have it to the full. And you have this echo of the overflowing cup and life in all of its fullness. That sounds like a flourishing life. That sounds like what the Yale course 
is trying to discover what kind of life is this? A contemporary theological understanding of abundant life might include a purposeful vocation, doing what makes your heart rise up and is for the good of others. Participation in a generative community, delight in sustaining relationships, and a sense of security in your faith, no matter what comes. The church would be helped if we could recover the theological meaning of the shepherding imagery. In the iconography of the church by the fourth century, Jesus as shepherd with lamb on shoulder was being replaced as Constantine had wed the state to the church. No longer was there the shepherd's hook, there was the gilded crozier, no longer the crown of thorns, there was the triple tiara of the Pope, and Christ was the pantocrator, the ruler above, beyond all things. And too often the church has taken that as its trajectory, above, beyond, not with. Recovering shepherding imagery could call the church to simplicity, to sacrifice, to presence with those who have lost their way. How does one forge a life worth living? It begins with a question. Is the life I am living the life that God is beckoning? It continues to be a work in progress, but it requires a credo. A credo is not a list of dogmatic statements. A credo is that upon which we can lean our hearts. People places, vision, and hope. We can learn from the wisdom of the prophets, of the saints, those who make their slow way across the earth with us. A flourishing life requires us to learn to deal with failure. We will fail how we deal with it is what portrays our character. When we ask to whom do we answer, we actually open up the possibility of fruitful regard for our neighbors, our environment, toward the very source of life itself, the loving shepherd. Actually, we answer to them all and they answer to us. You see, the most amazing thing about being a human being is that God addresses us and we are capable of responding. I've often wished I could hear the very clear word, Abraham, Sarah, take up and move to a new country Well, actually, most words from God require discernment and radical trust, which entails risk, and yet we have enough faith to take the next hesitant step. We listen to the voice, and as Jürgen Moltmann likes to say, the road emerges as we walk on it. Now, it may seem a rank luxury to ponder a life worth living when our lives do not experience the jeopardy of a soldier in Ukraine, a child in Gaza, a young woman in a refugee camp along the Thai-Burma border. Perhaps our lives will be more worth living as we begin, begin to answer to them in our prayer, through our voting, 
through our giving, through our advocacy. A life worth living expresses joy. My friend Angela Williams Gorell, who has taught in the Yale Project, considers joy a counter agent to America's despair. Oh, she's not fluffy about it. It's not easy. It's gritty. It's not ephemeral. Joy is what we feel deeply in our bones when we are connected to that which is good and beautiful and meaningful. Joy does not exclude suffering, but actually allows one to plumb more deeply the fullness of life. And we are unfailingly accompanied by God's own shepherding presence. But finally, what life is worth living? It is participating in Christ's resurrection, in the paschal mystery of dying and rising. Resurrection is not just about Jesus, nor is it simply past tense. As the old, old Roman liturgy puts it, the joy of the resurrection renews the whole world, and that becomes the very rhythm of our lives through life, through death. Already, we are risen to walk in newness of life. Thanks be to God. Now receive the benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God look kindly upon you and give you peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.